Welcome. Uh, just a quick, um, let's say full disclosure, it's not a major thing, but it could have become uh, a big problem. I had a technical glitch for some reason with the file that I uh, created and updated recently. I've shown several times of post-impressionism. And uh, at this point, that's pretty important because that's a topic that a lot of people aren't uh, clear on. They, they just assume Van Gogh and Gauguin and others were straightforward impressionists and that is completely incorrect. And so obviously uh, Van Gogh and, and Gauguin are some of the most interesting uh, topics we're gonna cover this semester. And we have a lot to cover and we're not meeting Wednesday. Everyone knows that, right? There are no classes Wednesday at the JC. Uh, I don't know about Thursday, it's a federal holiday, so it might be both, but I know Wednesday, our next class not happening. Don't waste time trying to look for the uh, ID, you know, login number because there won't be any uh, Zoom or in-person classes at uh, Santa Rosa JC. It's an administrative preparation uh, planning day or something. Just as a reminder, I mean, it's in the syllabus and I've said it before. Okay, and of course your papers are due tonight by midnight, so you have some more time, but let's start with that. We're gonna, I'm gonna uh, full disclosure also, we're gonna go to at least 425. Now we're scheduled to go to 430 and I've never done that. I usually stop, as you notice, around 415, 418. But we have so much to cover and I don't want to cut anything. I mean, I might have to cut one slide, but uh, you can see from the list, these artists are some of the most important uh, painters of the 19th century or of the last few hundred years, really. Uh, besides Gauguin and Van Gogh, we have Cezanne and um, you know some of the other big names of post-impressionism. Um, so a Surratt, for instance, uh, people you've heard of or seen their paintings if you didn't know their names. So we'll get to those in a few minutes, uh, the first must know, but let's start with, um, just to clarify um, about your papers, midnight is the deadline if you don't want it to be counted late, which you have that option, but it'd be five points off if you send it in tomorrow. Uh, remember that it's, now obviously I've done this for both classes and revised it, but you can see it applies to you where the dark, uh, you know, marker signing in is 1.2. That's this class. You would start just like you did with your first papers. I've said this before so many times, but, but I just want to do one more re reminder here. That's the format you need to send it as a PDF to markw at aol.com. And um, of course, uh, that needs to say our 2.1 short paper number two I sent the cover sheets, uh, I believe it was Sunday. Underline last name, comma, first name. Most of you have been doing that and it's very helpful and I appreciate it and thank you so to the readers so I can log them in more uh, correctly. Okay, somebody had a question because now's the time to ask questions. Yeah, so I'm sorry, you might have uh, changed it or something like that, but on the syllabus it said due midnight, November 10th. Was that changed no, earlier? No, November 10th is, uh, uh, there's no classes so I can, yeah, it's November 8th. Uh, you know, I don't know why, but I'm looking at my syllabus. That's just strange. I, I understand this is a legitimate question, very legitimate, but I cannot begin to uh, see. Look, I'm looking right at my, I'll show you. It's right here, <laughs> right there. Midnight, November 8th. Oh, okay, no yeah, then mine was- ten. So, so, you know, I, I gotta stick to that. Otherwise we get chaos. <laughs> and uh, also because there's another logical reason for that, because I want to uh, take the time to start getting them graded because this is my largest class, right? And a lot of people aren't going to be, you know, logged in here now and they might not even watch this until Friday. So I did answer that question again. I'm not, you know, it's, gainsaying or disputing that right to ask any kind of question that relates to deadlines and things. But I know I mentioned this before, but I guess I hadn't actually held up the syllabus and that's it right here. It's the syllabus that I created for this class and with the dates right there in black and white. So it, it is November 8th. Um, at this point, I would say if, if you feel that the extra couple of days or a few days, whatever, anything under a week beyond the eight, that would mean between now and what, uh, the 14th, that's six days from now, 
you'd only have five points off and you can make it up so easily with extra credit. If that would make the difference in your quality, you know, of your, of your second paper, the, the quality of the writing or the research, whatever, uh, then go ahead and take that time. It's not, you know, you have 60 points, extra credit options, more than I've have ever had in any, or actually one time I did do that. The first semester we went Zoom, well, I wasn't using Zoom, I was using some other format and it was a headache, right? Remember when they shut down at spring break 2020, I did give people 60 points extra credit then. And I'm doing that now because of some issues I already mentioned earlier, not having to do with this class, but because of the transition from in person and the differences between the two classes. I teach both kinds and now I have one in person. Bottom line is you got lots of extra credit options and there's some really easy ones. So one article, and here's a tip for some of you, by the way, uh, one of your, it was John, yes. One of your fellow students has already sent me a link to the article in Marin Magazine. It's this month's issue, so you would have no trouble finding it. And it would have, of course, my name, but also it says an instructor in art history at Santa Rosa Junior College, author of X books, whatever. But yeah, they have a mini bio at the bottom of each uh, uh, article that's you know, not staff written. This was something I pitched them years ago. And we already covered that, if you remember, the Miwok, right? And Pomo Indian cultures that once inhabited what we call the North Bay. I, I really worked hard on that article and did the same kind of research you guys have, are doing or have done on your first paper and are about to finish your soon will on your second. So it might be interesting for you just to glance at, but you don't have to read it to get the five points. If you send me a link, it'd be nice if you give me a one or two sentence response about what you did or didn't think about the article or what you learned, I mean, or, uh, or if anything. But you don't have to. I didn't say that was required. So just sending a link to that and uh, you know, making sure you identify yourself fully as which class you're in, right? Um, Any time this semester before final exams uh, will get you five points. So if you need the extra time, you have that option. But I, yeah. I would recommend if you can get it done in a completed uh, way to send it in uh, by midnight tonight, and then it's just you know not, no points off for being late. Okay. But you said for the five points knocked off if you want the quality it's a week from today you said and then after that one week is starts it's 10 points off yeah that's been my policy uh, we i know it's been a long time the first night of class we or afternoon we went over that and it is on everyone's handouts so of course that's the course uh policies and uh, sorry course course policies and grading procedures uh, yeah it's the first handout we went over the first day of class but you've got it in your files or if you want to you could easily go back just to double check i don't think anybody needs to but if you want to that i did cover that on the first night of class and that was in the very early part right it's in the first 20 minutes or so because it's so important i want people to know how how grading is handled in this class. So in other words, if you wait a whole week, it's 10 points off, but it doesn't go up after that. So if that's another option and you want to take two weeks or something, you have that option. I, I don't believe in uh, taking more and more points off the later an assignment is. After about two, three weeks, what's the point? People give up and either drop the class or just figure they can't recover and get a good grade. And so, you know, kind of stop participating or stop trying. That's not good to me. So it, it's a two-part late policy. I've said it before, but once again, briefly, if it's anything under seven days late, it is five points off. So anything after midnight until through the 14th, six days from now, would be five points off. And then after that, it's 10 points off. As long as you get it in before finals, I won't accept a paper's final exam week. It's too late. We've got too much. We have to get all the grades in before New Year's. And you know, there are holidays. I'm sure you guys have family events planned uh, or even maybe going out of town. <clears throat> I won't be, I'll be grading all kinds of papers and late papers and extra credit and, and of course final exams and calculating the grades. Cause I've never missed a deadline for turning grades in on time. And I, 25 years, I call that a pretty good record so you guys benefit because you know your grades by the beginning of january and you have them in your records for transfer purposes right for gpa calculations okay we need to get started with the lecture but any it's important because i'll stick around i always do after the last slide uh for as many minutes as need be for people to ask more questions does anybody have any other urgent question relating to your paper um the extra credit questions let's if you have those would you save those until the end of the um lecture today 
Okay, any other? Yeah, again, I held that up to the screen and no one's joined us late at this point. If someone does, I'll just have to go back and replay this. Uh, or <laughs> just remember what I said the last two weeks about late policy. Okay, so yeah, midnight tonight, I hope I'll see a majority of your papers. And if the rest of, you know, some of you want to take a few more days, try to get it in no later than the 14th, sooner if possible. And then they get logged in and grade sooner that way and return to you the grade sooner. Okay, so we have a lot to cover and we have several new definitions. So let's do this. I'll get rid of this here as usual, move it up. I am going to give you the first definition, which is the most important one, and it easily could appear on the true false section of the final, okay? Which is our topic for the entire lecture, post-impressionism, okay? It's a single sentence, but not a short sentence, the one sentence definition. You notice some of these, it took two sentences, like, like impressionism itself and English realism, but this is a one sentence definition. Okay, so here we have, make sure you write this down for references uh, when you want to look at your notes during the final. Okay, post-impressionism was a movement of painting uh, which is, I'm sorry, it is a term for, I apologize, I'll start over. <laughs> I'm just so used to using that phrase. I, I shouldn't have, this is on autopilot here. I'm not getting much sleep lady. I'll start again, all right. It's a general term. Again, post-impressionism is a general term for those artists who pass through an impressionist phase, comma, it's a general term for those artists who passed through an impressionist phase, comma, and then created their own unique and individual styles, period. And then created their own unique and individual styles, okay? So it, it doesn't tell you anything except that it relates to what we've covered, and you all know the definition of impressionism by now. That is definitely coming up on the, on the uh, final as very likely will be this definition as well. Okay, because I said for sure, at least one impressionist painting would be on the final, uh, probably the essay part, maybe maybe ID part as well. All right, so let's see some examples of artists that uh, were what in that category, meaning that they had first or at some point, you know, it doesn't matter when, but at some point earlier in their career, they had, uh, you could say dabbled in, practiced for a while impressionism, but then moved beyond it. Van Gogh is the most famous example. He's not an impressionist. I keep seeing that falsely stated in, in all kinds of websites and, and articles and newspapers, but no, no art history historian or art history text would ever make that mistake. He did dabble in impressionism for a few months, maybe some people think a year or so when he lived in Paris with his brother, uh, but those aren't the paintings you've ever seen of his work. One of them, by the way, is owned, the only Van Gogh owned anywhere in the Bay Area. Only one Van Gogh out of the thousands of paintings he painted uh, is in San Francisco, and now it's on loan so you can't go see it. <laughs> It was at the Legion of Honor. It'll be back next year sometime. And it's a student uh, exercise. And that one is a tiny little thing that's only a few inches. Well, maybe it's a foot, probably about a foot by foot. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a study of some shed, <laughs> literally, in Montmartre in Paris. You don't have to know that. I'm just telling you, if you're curious, are there any Van Goghs in the bear? Only when they come here on a loan. So that one, ironically, is a loan to, I forget what museum back east, for a special exhibit. Um, because it is an example of, of impressions of Van Gogh, but he, that wasn't his style. He created his own. We'll get to him in a few minutes. Okay, here's our first must know. Boy, this one ought to be famous. Even if you've never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, or the characters all stand in front of this painting because they go to the Art Institute of Chicago. Whereas I told you last week, if, 
If this wasn't obvious a week ago, by the end of this lecture, you're going to see that's a museum. If you care, I have any interest in, let alone uh, you know, passion for knowing more about and seeing original works by both Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. In this country, you can't find any museum as good as the Art Institute of Chicago. They own dozens of world famous paintings, and this is one of them. Okay, here we go. It's called uh, Paris, a Rainy Day. Appropriate, right? Are you guys getting rain up there by now, probably, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Another atmospheric river is coming, they say. Well, this is just a normal day in the fall in Paris. So, again, the title Paris, a Rainy Day. The artist's name is Cayabot. That's how you'd pronounce it roughly in, in French. Um, so it's spelled C-A-L-L-E-B-O-T-T-E. -E. And the date is 1877. Here we're looking at a painting that is a hybrid of realism and impressionism. And so that was a style that in a way, you could, obviously it has to do with impressionism because about half the painting is impressionist, the whole back uh, or upper or distant part of it. We'll talk about those details in a second. But why we call this a post-impressionist painting is because Kayabo was someone who exhibited with the impressionist and did some purely impressionist paintings early on. But then he decided he liked this hybrid, you can call it, or a, a blend isn't the right word. That sounds like things are overlapping with each other. No, they're not. They're very distinct sections. As you can see already at a glance, that are realistic, mostly the foreground, right? Uh, especially the couple walking towards us and the man that looks like Grover Cleveland, President Grover Cleveland on vacation or something. <laughs> Don't ask me why I've seen photographs of him from behind. There he is walking with this umbrella. Those three figures are strictly realistic. They're not impressionist at all, as are their umbrellas. The street lamp, and even most people would agree these two uh, figures in the middle ground crossing the street with their umbrellas. But almost everything else, certainly everything from about the midline, right? all the way back to the you know, top of the buildings and right, you know, all the way through the entire uh, upper half of the painting, which is of course the distance section. That's all impressionist as you, you should recognize by now because we covered, remember what makes something impressionist. So he you know, had been an impressionist for a while. I'm not sure if he ever really, those paintings, if he sold them or not, but he, he just quickly, Kayabo decided, you know, I, I like to do something a little less straightforward impressionist, but I don't want to go back to, you know, realism was what they were taught in their art schools, right? So he blended the two, oops, I said blended. He would uh, use a hybrid of some parts of his paintings, usually the foreground like this one, are strictly realistic and uh, usually the middle ground and, and distance or uh, far ground uh, are impressionistic. And that's pretty obvious when you get, let's do a close up here. That building is clearly impressionist. And of course, so is the street from roughly behind these two men here all the way to the, the end of this, you know, what you can see the horizon. Well, you can't see the horizon, but obviously all the way into the distance. Okay, so that's uh, the meaning of this. He, he exhibited with the impressionists. And yes, he was one of the most popular impressionists because people like this hybrid or mixed, the other way you could say is a mixture of realism and impressionism that he became famous for. So that makes him one of the first, not the first, but one of the first post-impressionists. The first one was Cezanne, we'll get to him in a few more slides. Okay, so formal analysis, pretty straightforward. This is very carefully balanced, unless you count the street, which it isn't as empty space, it's obviously a solid mass, then clearly it's, it's balanced. But I know most people think of it or it looks like or feels like it's unbalanced toward the right because of the uh, the weight of the figures closest to us, the couple and the man passing by them. But re in reality, it's it's balanced left to right. And you could make the case certainly the sky is is, is open or empty space. So then you could uh, definitely say or should say it, it's unbalanced uh, somewhat toward the bottom. But again, if you do the line somewhere down here, the middle of the street, you could make the case the whole thing is balanced in both directions. Okay, then we have for space. Well, here we have scientific perspective. <coughs> Most impressionists didn't use scientific perspective except Renoir and Monet sometimes. Well, Pissarro occasionally. So some of them did, but, but not in a majority of their impressionist paintings. But here, 
Kayabo continued to pretty much adhere to the rules of Renaissance realism when it came to depth or space. Obviously, this is atmospheric perspective. It just pops out at you. Everywhere you look into the distance is blue hazy look, of course. And then we have the foreshortening of all of the, you know, everything that goes into the distance. It recedes. The street, the sidewalk, the buildings, of course. Uh, then we have overlapping, of course, of the clothes over the figures, the figures over the street, uh, and their umbrellas and so forth. Uh, we have... Um, Let's see, diminishing size, obviously, with the figures on the street. And uh, I think I said scientific perspective, but if I didn't say it outright, yes, there's a vanishing point in the distance here. Okay, then we have mostly cool colors. You know, Paris, in, this would be about like November. I've been in Paris every month of the year, except the one, the famous song, April in Paris. It's the only month I have not been to Paris. So I'm not sure what the weather's like in April, but I've been there in November. This is a classic example of uh, mid-fall weather, maybe early November, about right this time of year. So cool gray and blues are the dominant colors. But if you get a close-up or take, you know, if you stood in front of this painting, which by the way, you can't get too close. I did that once when my daughter and I went. The first time I took her to Chicago, she was like 12. And of course, she got excited because she'd seen Paris Blues Day off when we were standing in front of this painting. And it was me, not her, that went too close to look at the cobblestones like I'm doing now with the close up. And uh, we, I was told to back off by an armed security guard, which is understandable. The painting is worth so much. It's too, it, it's too valuable to even be insured. Well, it probably is insured, but the number would be well above, you know, seven figures or 10, how many, what, nine, whatever. It's always worth over a hundred million easily, this painting, who knows, maybe maybe a quarter of a billion if it were to be sold. And of course it will never be sold. The museum has promised not to sell any of their world famous paintings when they acquired them. <clears throat> they were gifts from someone, rich collectors of French painting. Okay, so let's see. We, oh yeah, we got a couple more. Is there a line? Well, yeah, here on the closer figures, the ones that are in sharp realistic detail, which of course is where the simulated texture is realistic. I would say it's soft and, and diffused on the entire street, even not just the foreground. But when you look at it at a glance, at least this part near the curb, the curb itself, those are realistic. So there is line between the cobblestones and on the curb and outline as, you know, most realistic paintings have on the foreground of the figures but everything else from the middle of the street all the way to the buildings in the background uh, there there isn't line as outline uh, and there's soft and diffuse modeling in that half of the painting of course as well as implied but not realistic cement texture like there is on the faces and clothing and umbrellas in the foreground it is both stable dynamic, but it's mostly stable. Look carefully because with the street lamp and the edges of the buildings, the corners of all the buildings, this couple, uh, the man passing by them standing straight upright, um, you know, there's a slight tilt to the handles of the umbrella, but just a slight tilt. The umbrellas themselves are the main dynamic object, but it's mostly stable if you look carefully. Okay, the largest mass, the street. And then probably it's a close call. Maybe if you take the couple as one mass, they would be the next largest. Uh, and then I guess the man passing by them. And of course, there is a little, I forgot to say, a little bit of warm color on the sides of some of the buildings, the yellows and oranges on uh, some of the walls. But uh, mostly it's blues and grays, so it's mostly cool. Um, okay. Now we get to a very important artist, Cezanne. And this is, his name is C-E-Z-A-N-N-E. -E. Self-Portrait, that's the title. Self-Portrait, 1879. Well, he was considered, just say most historians, it's always safest to say it that way in your notes or on the exam if this happens to come up on the final, that most historians consider Cezanne to be the first post-impressionist. He definitely... Uh, did a uh, period, had a period, I should say, of painting impressionists, uh, straightforward impressionists, mostly landscape style scenes, uh, some, some others, but he's much, much more famous as an early post-impressionist, if not the first. 
uh, everything I've done research-wise and talked to all the art historians that I've ever talked to would agree he was the first one to break away. From, he exhibited with the Impressionists, in other words, he's part of that movement in the 1860s and early 70s. But by the time he did this self-portrait, he had already broken with them and invented his own unique style. So now that leads to our second definition, uh, which he created. Here we go. Uh, it's a little bit long definition. I think it's three lines. So I will say it slowly and repeat it. Building blocks of color. You see it's halfway down your list of terms to know. Uh, about the middle of the page. They're building blocks of color. What is that? It's a style of post-impressionist painting invented by Cezanne, comma. A style of post-impressionist painting invented by Cezanne, comma, in which he used firmly placed alternating blocks of warm and cool hues in which he used firmly placed alternating blocks of warm and cool color combined with a bold outline, you see it around his bold head there, to create the illusion of three dimensions. But some people would even dispute that last phrase. I'll say it again. He, you know, this is a style, right? Building blocks of color, style, a post-impressionist, sorry, style invented by Cezanne in which he used firmly placed brush strokes of warm and cool hues, alternating, sorry, alternating, firmly placed alternating brush strokes of warm and cool hues combined with the bold outline to create the impression of three dimensions. So this is, many people consider it the first modern portrait. To say it's the first modern painting is a little bit of a stretch because how can you say, you know, but there's no question that this is at least the first painting to use some post-impressionist, that style of his that he invented, uh, uh, techniques that no one had thought of before. His own unique an original style is what he, he called it. He named it building blocks of color. It's an odd, I know, phrase, but that was his phrase for his technique. So we see it here. Let's get back to a close up very clearly here. You know, there's a little bit of warm here. You see these brush strokes, you can see each one individually. Well, let's do it here. Yeah, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. You get the idea. And he would cross his uh, eyebrows, you know, cool, warm, a little bit of cool, warm, warm. And then it uh, gets cool again when you get over toward the end. It's more obvious around certain parts of a painting, but it's there if you look closely. If you drew a line, in other words, from, from uh, uh, right to left, or it doesn't matter if you go from left to right, from one end to the other, of the main objects. Now, that's only on the main objects. I didn't add that because the definition is already long enough. He didn't do it in the background because it wasn't needed. He was trying to show himself in front of what we don't know. Is it a medicine cabinet, wallpaper, a window, a mirror? We don't know. He doesn't care. It's not important. What's important is him, his own image as he looks at us. And in essence, he's saying, I'm throwing down a gauntlet or what do you want to say, a challenge to all my fellow uh, painters, both the realistic painters and impressionists. It's time for a new style and I'm going to lead the way. He never said that in so many words, but he was interviewed and he was, in essence, that's close to the concept he was trying to, or the goal, I should say, the goal he was trying to achieve, which is to break out of even what the degree of realism there was left in Impressionism. He was moving, in other words, here's how to summarize it. Uh, Cezanne moved even further away from the rules of Renaissance realism than the Impressionists. He broke even further away from realism. In other words, moved painting in Western, of course, we're talking about uh, European painting and in general, you know, Western painting, closer to abstract. It's not abstract yet because you see a face with eyes, right? And everything's in the right place. You know, a nose, a beard, a jacket with collars. Yes, okay, so it's still not an, uh oh. My internet connection is unstable. See, I had that problem before I signed on. Okay, hang on. Can you guys hear me? 
Yeah, you've been clear. Yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah, good. That was just temporary. Well, the weather up there could cause problems for some of you guys. I hope not. It's, that happens in the more like in January in the winter. Let's hope we don't have that again. All right. So once again, what he's doing here is is you know striking out uh, in in new ways or you know covering new ground or what do you want to say you know creating a new concept. In fact, I'll leave one more fact about the meaning, and we'll do a formal analysis is that uh, according to many abstract painters, well, just say Picasso, keep it simple. Picasso actually said this, this is a paraphrase, an exact quote, that uh, modern painting begins with Cezanne. In fact, that might be a direct quote, it's pretty close. He, that is Picasso, who's probably the first, ab well, he is the first abstract painter, and we won't be uh, covering him because that's something for art 2.3 or 2.2, uh, which hopefully I'll be teaching someday. Uh, not next semester, but in the next year or two. That, that uh, period we call abstract is usually attributed that movement, if you want to call it, uh, or even concept of uh, you know early modern painting is, is attributed to uh, Picasso. He was the first openly abstract painter. And he gave credit to Cezanne. He said, without Cezanne, there would be no modern painting. He's, he should be considered you know, the father, he didn't say that phrase, but he would have said, Manning, yeah, he did actually pretty close. Uh, you can say it's a, a, a statement by Picasso uh, made clear that he felt a modern painting began with Cezanne. Okay, and that's why we're looking at this. It's the first post-impressionist painting of self-portrait style, uh, I see, sorry, of, of his style of Again, building blocks of color, which is clearly the first identifiable, you know, uh, completely clearly identified movement of post impressionism or style, if you want to call it that, within that. Remember, that's a catchphrase. Post impressionism is just a general term, right? So now this is a style we're looking at of Cezanne's. All right, let's do the formal analysis. Well, we already covered the warm and cool, except that we want to say the background looks mostly cool. But some people would say, well, the brown on these, whatever they are, you know, it looks like diamond pane leaded windows. You see them a lot in Europe, especially in France, but we don't know. It could just be wallpaper. So that diamond pattern behind his head, that the actual outline of it uh, looks warm. Uh, and then there's a mixture of warm and cool on the wall. I assume that's a wall behind him. Um, <clears throat> but on his face, it's it's almost equal parts warm and cool as is this whole point, the concept of this style. And even somewhat on his jacket, it's not as obvious here because of course it, yeah, I'm sure he was you know, uh, wanting to at least not focus on the jacket or have the viewer, I mean, focus on anything more than on him, his face. So that's where he used the building blocks of color. And then we have the bold outline around his, his whole head really <laughs> pretty much and certainly you see some of it on the jacket is certainly in the collar at least uh there is no simulated texture here again with impressionism the same thing applies it's just implied uh, textures here and then we have the modeling is soft and diffused of course but for space there's two techniques for shortening on his shoulder some might think they see it on his beard, but mostly clearly his shoulder and then overlapping and that's it. There's no other techniques for space here. He's the largest mass and then the, you can say pattern on the wall behind him. There's really only two masses. Uh, it's balanced left to right, I would say, unless you don't count, you know, this is wall and that's wall, it's just different patterns or, or uh, you know, detailing behind his head. However, if you count again, this is empty space, it depends on how you look at it, or just the fact that his shoulders are obviously much wider uh, than his head, you could make the case it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Uh, and then we have um, stable, uh, it's mostly stable, although the background kind of makes you think dynamic uh, qualities uh, to the background because of the diagonal lines on the wall, you just can see the pattern or decorative detail behind his head. But he is mostly straightforward and upright. Of course, the top of his head is curved, so that's dynamic. Um, let's see, in colors, we already covered warm and cool, right? Alternating. Let's see. Oh, and the rhythm should be obvious. Oh, I didn't mention rhythm with, with uh, Paris rainy uh, day, so I'll go back to that. But rhythm, to finish on this one, is very obvious with the geometric pattern behind him his two eyes, his eyebrows, 
his beard and the folds of his jacket. But again, for rhythm, it should be obvious. We've got the umbrellas, the cobblestones, the bodies, the human bodies, their hats, and of course the buildings in the background. Okay, now let's move on to the second saison. So you see if an artist is uh, really important, if we have just enough time in this entire uh, sem semester, you know, length course, to um, cover 600 years of art history. And if an artist gets two slides, that's a tip, if it should be obvious, that um, that artist's work is, is really important. And you want to take very careful notes and study them. So um, this is Cezanne, again, C-E-Z-A-N-N-E. -E. And uh, it's called Mont Sainte Victoire. That's M-O-N-T, S-A-N-T-E, and then V I C T O R I E. So it's it's Mount Saint Victor or Victory, some would say. Uh, it's it's a French word, Mont for mountain, and Saint is spelled with a S A N T E, French spelling for saint, and vic, Victory, but with an I E. Again, S A N T E hyphen capital V I C. T O R I E, 1898. He painted, Cezanne painted this mountain over 20 times from different angles, different views. And that sounds similar, doesn't it? Or should sound familiar to you because that's what um, Monet did with a lot of landscapes all over France, including his own estate at Giverny, where he painted hundreds of water lilies, <laughs> sometimes the same pond exactly you know with just different uh, times of day and different uh, degrees of uh, close up or further away views well Cezanne loved this mountain it was one of the most famous mountains in southern France I, I don't know if it's in the Alps it probably is but it's in southern France and he had a you know a house you could say or a villa in southern France I assume he also had a, an apartment in Paris, most of the painters who were successful. By the time he painted this, he was world famous when Cezanne painted this. This really shows the building blocks of color, even more maybe than his self-portrait, uh, especially when you look at the quarry. These are rock cliffs or the faces of a, an abandoned quarry, I believe it was. It, you know, Otherwise, it'd be dust coming out and there'd be cranes you know, and people working somewhere along the bottom part of it. So it was an abandoned uh, quarry, rock quarry, of course, whatever they got out of it, they had already finished using it. So it was an abandoned rock quarry, which was a nice foreground for him. And it was a perfect subject to use that uh, building blocks of color, these firmly placed alternating brush strokes of warm and cool hues. You see them here, even on the top part, and you definitely see them on this whole central area here, the main block of stone that he's focusing our view on. And then on the mountain as well, right? You see them alternating warm, cool, warm, cool, warm. And then uh, somewhat a little bit, but less obviously in the sky. He didn't usually do that, you know, go, go to that extreme, but uh, you can even see some in the trees like this tree here which is almost abstract isn't it? it's getting close to that but even here you see warm and cool now you could say oh well it's fall maybe it's fall weather and the trees leaves like they are in some parts of the bear i was just up in uh, uh san anselmo there's a here's a tip for you for extra credit uh and i wrote a piece about it so it's a, it's, a, it's a twofer you could get 15 points send the link to the article i wrote on the san francisco theological seminary which ain't anywhere near san francisco <laughs> it's in san anselmo and oh no my cat got in here <clears throat> sorry it's, we're not gonna have any peace i have to take her out hang on <sighs> who let you in come on <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> sorry life does happen you know <clears throat> at least you didn't hear my dog bark at the mailman like two minutes before i, I logged on for everybody <laughs> Okay, back to what we're saying. This 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 was a, a, a typical kind of subject for uh, Cezanne and then later on for many other painters, uh, but he's the one that made it famous. These uh, landscapes, in other words, which is, you know, you might think, how could you make a landscape 
with building blocks of color, that sort of quasi abstract thing that he did on a, his self portrait. But it's obvious when you look at this, it, it, it lends itself that new style he created very well to landscapes. And if you squint, as my father used to do, he was a, a full-time artist himself, supported our family on his freelance artwork. If you squint, that's a lot of other people have mentioned that too. And some of the classes I took in art history and other colleges, you can kind of get a sense of how these building blocks of color almost break down into separate blocks, separate, you know, uh, rectangular shapes, if you want to call them that, or, and the whole, in other words, scene can be seen or looked at if we want to get redundant, the whole, this whole scene, this whole landscape can be looked at uh, as, you know, just blocks of color just by themselves, almost to where you almost lose the context of, uh, if you see what I mean, if you want to try that exercise. I didn't finish the extra credit thing. And that's why I get interrupted by uh, when I was trying to tell you there are two options. If you want to, you can um, go to that seminary and just walk around and take four photos. The buildings are you know, accessible from the parking lot. And it's a view, it's right near Mount Tom. The views are to die for. It's from the 1890s. It's like, it's called the San Francisco Theological Seminary in San Anselmo. It's like three miles from downtown Santa Fe. Parking is free. You're welcome. You know, I wouldn't, you know, want to suggest you go into the buildings. You don't need to. You might even go there when they're closed, uh, but it's a functioning seminary. It's been there for now, what, a hundred and 25 years now, I think 130 actually. Yeah, right. Anyway, so that's one thing. That's extra credit option. Architecture option is worth 10 points. And then if you want to um, download and forward to me uh, a link to the article I wrote, I think it was in, yeah, it was in uh, 2019 in Marin Magazine or the one on the Miwok, uh, which, which I talked about before. That's out in this month's issue, November issue of Marin Magazine. Um, it's easy to find, you know, through their archival finding <coughs> uh, function, any article. So you, you just plug in the titles and you could do both. Then you have four, uh, 20 points, two articles, five points each, and maybe some architecture photos. All right. <clears throat> so formal analysis. Now there's a lot more to say about the meaning and pretty much already defined the style and how important he was in them the movement away from realism and even further away from that than impressionism. So here we go. Um, formal elements. Well, what's the largest mass? I would say it's the quarry itself and then the mountain and then maybe the largest group of trees, probably this one here. For here, the only technique for space I see is overlapping. I don't see foreshortening here. He, he got further and further away from, you know, any of those depth te techniques to depict depth except for overlapping. Um, you could make the case of the vanishing size, I guess, but to me, these trees don't look a lot smaller than the ones in front of the quarry. But if, if they seem that way to you, I guess you could say, well, maybe there's some area around the top of the quarry where there's smaller trees. So you could say that's a... Wait, sorry, did you say atmospheric perspective is the only... I didn't get to that yet. I didn't oh, get... sorry, what did you sure, say was... No, that's fine, I'll say it again, overlapping. Oh, over. Okay, sorry. And aperture expected, definitely not. No, because he's not using the blue hazy wash over an entire section of the painting. He's using, it's a good question that you raised. Uh, he's using the alternating warm and cool hues with no regard to, to depth. It's not about depth. So I understand why it's maybe at first glance, uh, it, that's a good thing you brought it up, actually, that it might seem like, isn't that some kind of, no, it isn't. It's, it, don't make that mistake. It's not atmospheric perspective. Uh, if it was, the whole mountain would be completely obscured by a blue hazy look. You see, you see the point. So no, he didn't use atmospheric perspective, even if it might at first glance appear that way. And then he did use overlapping. And I guess you could say diminishing size, maybe on the trees. I mean, it's kind of hard to determine, but I guess they, they look slightly smaller uh, further away from the top of the, the quarry than they do right in front of it. So you could make that case. Well, this, Mark, wouldn't there also be diminishing size on the mountain? Mm, I wouldn't say so. The mountain, if there were two mountains and one was smaller, yeah, but not if there's only one mountain. It's a good question too, but yeah, um, I would say no. Yeah, except on the trees, you, you can see some on the trees. Now, and no scientific? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. And no scientific 
perspective? Oh, definitely no. Behind? Definitely yeah, no. He, he stopped using vanishing points. Uh, he was interviewed a lot because by this time he was so famous that uh, some of the other younger artists would come to him for, you know, and newspaper articles and magazines were being published about his work and his work was being exhibited all over the US, Canada, Europe. Yeah, he, he was world famous by this time. No, he, he never, he, he used to perhaps maybe, well, I don't think he did when he was an impressionist either, but maybe some of his earlier impressionist paintings, but not by the time he developed this style. So there's no vanishing point, in other words. Uh, it's just overlapping and a limited amount of diminishing size. Again, moving on, we have the warm and cool colors. Most of the colors on the rock face at a glance look more warm than the trees. So you could make that case that it's a you know balance between the areas covered by the trees and the rock quarry itself, mostly the rock is warm, but if you get close, you know, it's, it's not strictly, again, it's an alternating set of brush strokes of warm and cool hues. The same in, is true on the mountain. There is bold outline. Remember, that's part of his style. And you see that all around the mountain and at the top of the rock quarry, I would say too. So there is some bold outline. Uh, and then um, the largest mass, I think I already said that. Yeah, I already covered that. Let's see, are we, oh, stable versus dynamic. No, mostly dynamic. Of course, the rock cliffs, at, the, at least this, what we can see, the top part of the quarry, those are mostly stable, but even there, there's some kind of dynamic detailing at the top. And all the trees, the mountain, of course, so it, are dynamic. It's mostly dynamic. Uh, and, they, and let's see, I was forgetting the modeling is soft and diffused, and there is no similar texture, none. Okay. Uh, oh, is it balanced? I would argue yes, both ways. Depends on where you draw the line for the top to bottom. It's always that's that's the case with any painting that's not 100% clearly unbalanced. Uh, but uh, left to right, some people think this tree rising here unbalances, but to me, the sky and the, this group of trees have enough, whoops, sorry, <laughs> have enough um, definition, you know. Uh, to me, it's roughly balanced both ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe if you count the sky as being empty, which see, he gives it texture here almost. Well, it's not simulated texture. It's the actual texture of the paint. I don't want to confuse you, sorry about that. The actual brush strokes here. Now on the sky, he didn't do the alternating. It wouldn't work for the sky for those building blocks of color, just on all the objects, you know, landscape. So if you count that as not having any, any mass, I suppose you could make the case it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Now we get to probably one of the most famous paintings ever created. It's also at the Art Institute of Chicago. They own it. Some smart person bought it when it was only about probably $50,000 or something. And I, I just read recently, this was recently reinsured or, or increased the insurance policy on it at the museum to $150 million. And I'll bet that's out of date by now. That was a couple of years ago. Okay, so this is a really important one. High possibility of being on the exam. Surat is the artist, S-E-U-R-A-T. A Sunday on La Grande Jatte. A Sunday on La Grande Jatte, or Jetty. Grande, as in French, is always spelled with an E, right? G-R-A-N-D-E. Jatte, or Jetty, but in French, it's pronounced roughly Jatte, is J-A-T-T-E. 1886. Okay, so what do we uh, describe this style as? It's clearly post-impressionist. Well, this one's a simple definition. It's a one-line definition. Okay, this is called pointillism, and it's on your list of terms. You see it there. So here we go. That one should take you long to write. Pointillism is a style of post-impressionist painting invented by Seurat, comma, right? Uh, in which thousands of tiny dots of color are used, which are supposed to blend in the eye of the viewer, in which thousands of tiny dots of color are used, uh, which are supposed to blend in the eye of the viewer, period. That was his intention. Did that work? Mm, you be the judge. Well, no. <laughs> you can see the dots. That this one actually set off the alarm when I, I I stepped in front of this painting. It wasn't on the same visit. 
I can't remember when, but anyway, this one, actually, there was an alarm and I, I was just having to get, I want to get some slides of it for my use in these classes. And I never even had my camera, you know, focused by the time. Understandably, they asked me to step back. I didn't know there was in, some kind of infrared ray or something. I don't know what it was. It set off the alarm without anything obvious. It's unfortunate you can't get so close that you could just like five inches or six inches away. You could even see every single dot if you did that. But even with this slide, you get the idea. Look at the grass. Look at this woman's you know, uh, body here uh, or this mother's dress, the trees. You, you see the dots. So Surat, you could say, was a failure. No, you can't. This style was wildly popular. I think everyone knows that if you've ever seen this painting. But not only that, about... 12 of his paintings, let's just say around a dozen, uh, which are owned by museums around the world, are some of the most valuable paintings in any museum's collection. It was while he was alive, he died at 31, that's really young, of tuberculosis or something like that. I don't know if it was fully or correctly diagnosed, but many historians think because he stood in front of this and many other of his pointless paintings, this one took over a year for him to finish for hours, day after day, month after month, breathing in the pain fumes. Of course he would have had to because he had to take these tiny little brushes and make these individual brush strokes. The patience that took is remarkable. In the movie, I told you guys about Lust for Life, he is shown as one of the minor characters when Van Gogh walks in and first meets Gauguin. It's a great scene. And he, got, uh, Surratt, is on top of a ladder adding dots to the, I think it's the trees or the top part of the painting. So that's a scene well worth, well, the whole movie's worth watching. It's about halfway through the movie. Anyway, uh, very accurate because that's when Van Gogh lived in Paris and was dabbling briefly in, in Impressionism. This is not Impressionist. Again, I've seen this listed as Impressionist. It's like, what? This is not even close. It has his own unique style. I just define it. I didn't even repeat that. Pointless. Okay. Now, when you look at it, the fact that it doesn't work quite the way he intended does not in any way detract from the originality, uh, which is that you have objects created by a brand new technique no one had ever thought of, these, these thousands of tiny dots of color. And they form, of course, solid looking objects, even though they aren't really. So let's now talk about the last thing about this painting that I know some people I've heard even at the museum in Chicago when I visited there and, and stood in front of this painting, but I've also seen it on, I don't know, some documentaries or, or online comments about this painting, that these figures look stiff and formal and therefore they don't look at all realistic or lifelike, like paper cutouts is what one critic said. I don't agree at all. I could understand that criticism. And so you can mention that it was criticized when it first was exhibited and it has been ever since by some observers, you can say some people, not just critics, but you know, individuals uh, who, who think it looks stiff and lifeless. What they're not aware of or overlooking, let's say, is that this is how people dressed and acted in public in middle-class 19th century public places in Paris or anywhere in France or even other parts of Europe. This is so summarizing the setting itself. What's he seen? What's he trying to portray here? A, a normal day where the new Parisian middle class, well, they wouldn't necessarily have to be from Paris. You could just say French, with a new French middle class went to relax. It's a small park, it's still there. Now, of course, people would be much more running around and, you know, whatever, uh, more, more uh, lively in their activity. But these people are dressed the way they dressed and walking and behaving the way they would have at that time. You look at any old photographs from that period, you, you can tell that. So I think that's a false uh, critique of it, but that's a matter of opinion. It's neither here nor there. But that was something that was said about it early on and still is as a criticism. I don't see it that way. To me, it made me feel like I could walk into the painting 
And when I first got to Paris, that's the first thing I did. I was lying on the ground, sleeping at night in sleeping bags, being rousted by French police every time. Had to move on, you know. I was I didn't have any money. I was hitchhiking. I had been robbed, so I was surviving on handouts. Yeah, for for a whole week in Paris. That's that's not the way most tourists see Paris. But it was a neat experience in a way because I got to sleep in this bar and then wake up. I think it was a Sunday anyway, on a weekend or something and watch people coming out. But of course, now they wouldn't be standing. So if you want to say stiffly or formally, they wouldn't behave the same because it's a different time. This was a, a very formal period, especially among middle class, you know, couples and families out in public. They would have behaved this way. OK, that's plenty on the meaning. So let's do the formal analysis. Here's the first thing. A lot of people at first glance think this can't be right but look carefully there are no lines none outline as outline or, or even really visual lines because if you get up close the closest thing to it might be but look it's just a bunch of dots of of colors there's no line these two none at all there is overlapping and here i think there's scientific perspective it certainly appears there's a vanishing point on the horizon and of course, diminishing size with the human figures and foreshortening of the landscape itself. Uh, I don't see it so much on the figures, but it's all, all on the, the, the grassy area. By the way, as Yeti, this is a park in the middle of the Seine. And it's also for those who might ever go there, unless maybe one or two of you have, you might know this. It's even in the movie National Treasure Part Two or something where Nicolas Cage's character goes here. Why? Because the first a uh, model for the uh, Statue of Liberty is still standing above this park on a bridge. You can see it uh, looking as though it were someone looking out at this view, not with the same, of course, people dressed the same way, but uh, the guy that created the French sculpture, of course, it made a gift to the United States. Uh, he created a model as any large sculpture would have to be done first. And it's, it's I think it's like 12 feet tall. It's a good size. It's just right there on this, uh, on one end of this island. So, okay, let's see. Largest mass would be the, the grass. There we go. The largest mass is the grass. And then I'd call this couple one mass. I think they, they have that appearance. And so they would be the second largest. And then if you want to call this guy a single mass, but I think they overlap enough with the three people over to the lower left that I would call that the third largest mass. And then after that, if you want to get to the, well, the fourth largest would be the, the mother uh, with the red umbrella or the tree behind them, if you count that as a, a mass because the leaves are not visible. There is no semantic texture here, none it's implied. And the modeling is soft and diffused, of course, on all of the objects, the trees, the people, their clothing. The rhythm is obvious, the human bodies, the umbrellas, heads, hands, arms. Um, the colors are cool on some of the clothing, of course, warm on other parts of especially the reds on the jackets and that one umbrella um and then you decide is that warm or cool where the shadow covers the grass it's it's hard to say i'd say it's mostly cool as as on this woman's dress here but of course her jacket here and her umbrella and hat the nearest or woman to uh, the viewer uh, is neutral but that's with that and the dog that's sniffing in the grass are the only real neutral colors and of course the water of the river in the background is is cool as is the white quay you know the quay right there at the bank the river bank if you just want to call it that in the background <clears throat> all right and then we have uh stable well yeah <laughs> the whole point is what i was saying earlier the, these figures are you know, posed in what today would be considered a stiff formal manner, but it was normal then. Uh, hardly any of them are. I mean, there's, okay, what, this girl's running here, right? Okay. And then, of course, there's a little bit of a dynamic uh, quality. Well, there is to the umbrellas, obviously, uh, and this dog, and these two, look at this pet monkey and a pet bulldog, I guess. <laughs> I assume they both are pets from that couple, uh, I guess. Um, you know, okay, so this guy's back. Yeah, a few details, but really the trees and almost all the human figures and even the sailboats in the river are mostly stable. It's roughly balanced uh, top to bottom, but left to right, I would actually go with the point of view. It's how you look at it, but th this couple does weigh it or unbalance the painting on left to right to towards the right side. 
because they seem to have the largest mass uh, in, in the painting other than the grass itself. Okay, uh, let's see. And I already said there's no line in covered modeling. All right, now we get to an artist who you all know something about, who doesn't know something about, maybe even quite a bit about Van Gogh. Okay, so, so next must know we have two Van Goghs. Van Gogh, everyone knows how to spell his name, wheat field with cypress trees. I think, again, most people know those uh, words, but uh, cypress is spelled C-Y-P-R-E-S-S. -S. Wheat field with cypress trees, 1889. Okay. What can I say except that Van Gogh was of course never appreciated or almost that's you have to be careful there were a few other artists young you know avant-garde you know that word right you could say progressive or advanced but avant-garde is a good word french word uh, some of them are you know are hip if you want to say it that way young artists in in paris did get that he was trying to to create a whole new concept of painting particularly landscape and that he was a genius one art critic wrote an article. I didn't know this until I read a biography of him. And it's also disputed that he died as, of suicide. So now new information is coming up that you know disputes some of the facts. But I'm going to tell you what we do know for sure about him. First, it's part of the meaning. Of course, you can't talk about the girl's work without talking about him. I think everybody knows that he was, today, most people say bipolar or manic depressive. I would say you could use either word because they didn't have the same diagnosis fine-tuned, but they knew that such a, a, a mental condition existed. Of course, it's hereditary. So he was suffering from both bipolar disease or manic depression and epilepsy. That's like two strikes against you when, when you're first born. Plus his father was a strict conservative uh, minister and never acknowledged his son's talent or skill. That would also make you, you know, <laughs> Maybe just a little less likely to be a flaming success right off the bat, you know. So his father never recognized his own son's genius. Maybe after, you know, Van Gogh died and some of his work got accepted, but his father actually died before he did anyway. So you could just say his own family didn't recognize, except for his brother. That's the one thing. And that's an important point. It's part of the meaning of this and the next Van Gogh slide, the next must know why we know what he meant and his intended meaning, plus how he felt when he did each painting, we don't have to guess. Why do we know? He wrote every day of his uh, adult life a letter to his brother, and his brother wisely saved them all. Uh, there's even a book called Letters to Theo, and I think it's like 2,000 pages long. as ours, two volumes. We don't have to guess what his thoughts were, what his feelings were, and what motivated him, and what his intended meaning was for any of his, at least his major paintings. Now, you know, some of his sketches we he didn't necessarily write about. So let's just say this. He only painted for about, uh, well, he was an artist for 10 years. His painting career was barely seven years from the time he developed his own style. And there's no other name for it, I wanted to find it in just a couple minutes, but the Van Gogh style. Again, not Impressionism. He's a post-Impressionist artist and he developed his own style, which he never labeled. So historians have come to call it the Van Gogh style, okay? That period, which is when he was doing all of his well-known work, lasted seven years. Okay, these are all facts about the meaning. <laughs> If you need me to repeat any of them, let me know. He painted over 2,000 paintings during that time. That is mind boggling. Or whatever word you want to use, rare, if not unknown, in the history of painting. Because if you do the math, that meant he painted one painting every day, except Sundays. He'd take a day off sometimes. Six paintings a week, every week, for seven years. <laughs> It's, it's hard to imagine how any single human being could achieve that, but he did. And of course, he then came up with this unique style. So now let's define that. The Van Gogh style has three main features. They're called signature motifs. I think I've used that word, but if not, you should definitely put that in now because you'll see that here and then with Gauguin, the next must-know artist. 
after Van Gogh for today's lecture. So the signature motifs that help uh, define his style, Van Gogh's style, are an undulating or swirling, you can use either phrase, I would use both if you're just taking the notes away, I'm giving to you there, an undulating or swirling motion in the main objects. You see it everywhere, even the clouds, the mountains. We know they're solid, but look, they have an undulating effect and definitely the plants do. The cypress trees, right, swirling upward. The wheat itself, as though the wind was, probably was blowing through at some point while he was standing there, uh, you know, painting it or sitting. <laughs> Uh, but he, he emphasized that effect again, as again, in undulating or swirling motion to all of the main objects in his paint, even his portraits, he did that. You'll see if we have time, I don't know if we have time for any of his self portrait Okay, that's the first feature or signature motif of his style. The second one would be um, a uh, soft but realistic modeling that's an important phrase. There's not really another way to say that. Soft but realistic modeling combined with a bold outline around the main objects. There's, there's pretty much no other way to say that. The second feature. Everybody got that? You see it here. The bold outline is around the tops of the mountains and definitely around the plants. You see it everywhere in the bushes, the trees. Uh, and uh, he didn't do it with, with the wheat because it didn't need, you know, wheat, individual stalks of wheat, you wouldn't do that. But every object that he could just say the main objects, uh, he would use again, a comb combine uh, soft yet realistic modeling with bold outline. And then the third feature is his own color theory. And that bears explaining because you can't summarize that in one line. He, it was brilliant. Van Gogh also, in all of his paintings, his style employed his own color theory. We don't have time to do the whole thing or even a summary of it, but I do, will tell you the three main colors that he used to symbolize different human emotions or thoughts. Yellow, okay, now this I will say slowly and repeat. This is really important to the meaning of this painting as well as the next must know. Yellow or shades of yellow and gold symbolize warmer or more positive human emotions to him, warm or positive human emotions, such as happiness, love, acceptance. He had very little of any of that in his life, except for his brother, of course, his brother did love him, believed in him. So the warmer human emotions, you could just keep the list short, were symbolized in his painting by use of the colors or various hues of yellow and gold, emotions like warmth, happiness, acceptance, um, and then green, to him, he used in his paintings uh, to symbolize negative human emotions like anger, hate, greed, fear, and all the other negative human emotions. And then finally, blue and shades of blue symbolized the divine presence or the awareness, you could even say he was the son of a minister. He did not practice any religion per se, but he did believe in, in, in God, a higher power. And so again, he, he used blue in his paintings to symbolize the presence of a higher power or divine presence is how he would put it in his letters to his brother. The presence of God is another way of saying it. Um, and it's interesting because he briefly trained as a minister and even got one short, like a few months, I think it was job as a minister to coal miners. Oh my goodness. The most d despised group of people, of workers in all of Europe. And, and, you know, there are still some coal miners in this country who aren't, you know, necessarily doing a very safe profession, right? It's very dangerous. Of course it is. But back then there was no safety guidelines and he would, go down in the mines when a collapse occurred and help bring the injured miners back up. And one day, this is just, you have to write this down. Some of his employers, you know, from the big head church of Brussels, I guess it was in Belgium, but whatever city in Belgium he had been assigned to do this ministry in this small mining town, coal town, they came to visit him and they fired him on the spot because he dare get dirty. <laughs> He went down into the mines to help the people he was there to supposed to minister to. Uh, gee, I think they were unclear on what the point of someone supposedly who's trying to convince people that there's a you know higher power. He he did it through action, but he got fired for that. It's one of his first jobs. 
uh, and then he took up, actually he was already sketching by that time. So he took up painting when he moved to Paris and uh, watched the Impressionists and met Gauguin, Seurat, Cezanne, he met all of them in Paris, they were the main ones. Okay, um, so that this painting has those elements, but if you might have thought this, and if it's not 100% clear, maybe you should write this as the last fact about the meaning. In this painting, he was going through some form of, you know, you can say a rapid cycling. That's a phrase some of you know. I have two family members, my mother and my homeless brother that have the same condition, as in bipolar, not the epilepsy. Um, I've witnessed it up close. Uh, you can go through these cycles where you go within a few, well, minutes is though, but hours anyway, or within the same day, from a high, a manic high to a deep, low depression. So many historians believe that this is what he was thinking. Now, he wouldn't have written that because he wasn't diagnosed with that until near the end of his life. The last year of his life, he finally was diagnosed by a doctor with that condition. He knew he had epilepsy, that was hereditary, and that was well known since Roman times. But he, he didn't you know, necessarily think of himself as a manic depressive. So in his letter to his brother, he didn't say, I was going through a manic episode. No, it's not that specific, but he did probably have that happening because we see the warm emotions, obviously the positive ones in the foreground, give way to the turbulent negative ones. And then above it all, looking down on it, the sky, the mountains in the distance, is at least some belief he still had. It's almost amazing. He never did abandon his, his faith, his religious faith. But again, he wasn't practicing any organized religion. It's not, not to be confused with just his overall belief that there was a spirit, a higher power in all living things and inanimate objects, including mountains. And we can see that because of the blue tint here of the mountains in the distance. Very similar to Native American beliefs and many other. The founding fathers, most of them didn't believe in strict Christian religion. They were deists, and that's similar to them, that there's some spiritual presence, higher power, however you want to call it, uh, in all things on earth, both living and in heaven. It's close to what he believed in. He never really read it, wrote, wrote a whole essay on his religious beliefs, but his letters mention that. Plenty of meaning now for this one, so the next one won't take as long to explain the next Van Gogh, but let's do this. It is brilliantly balanced. The land itself and the sky are almost equal areas because see the bottom of the painting is, and this slide is cut off. It would go down to at least the bottom of the computer screen, at least on my screen. And if you add that extra inch or so at the bottom, you can see it, it is, he thought about these things. He never actually used, well, once in a while, yeah, rarely he would use scientific perspective. So this doesn't have scientific perspective, but that is atmospheric perspective that should be obvious on the mountains, as well as being symbolic of his belief in higher power. <laughs> it's also indicative of the, the techniques for space, which he used were overlapping, foreshortening, diminishing size, and atmospheric perspective, hardly ever and definitely not on this or the next must know and go. He wasn't using scientific perspective. He didn't use the vanishing point. He's had a free hand approximation of some of it in some of his landscapes. You can almost think you see a vanishing point, but we know he almost never did that. So it has those other techniques again, including the atmospheric perspective in this one. Uh, the colors, of course, mostly cool in the sky and on the mountains and the trees. So the majority of the painting is cool. Uh, and then we have the warm colors on the wheat in the foreground. The rhythm, brilliant. Of course, the undulating effect of the mountains and the clouds, as well as the plants, especially the two trees there, uh, swirling or undulating creates powerful rhythm as well as makes the entire painting dynamic. There is anything stable here. The largest mass would be the sky. Here, the sky definitely has mass. Then it's probably a close call. The wheat field is slightly larger, I would say, than if you count all of the plants together as one mass, it's, it's pretty close. It's hard to say which is larger. Um, but if you take them separately, then it, the second largest mass would be the wheat field, then the mountains, and then I guess the cypress trees. I already said this bold outline, soft but realistic modeling. There is no simulated texture. It's implied again. To, so that's something you picked up from Impressionism. Um, and of course, we have the, the rhythm. I think I already said that with the wheat fields itself and the uh, uh, branches of the trees, these two side by side cypress trees in the clouds and the mountains. 
Okay, this is the most famous. Wait, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, very quick. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I I believe you about the last one. But like, how is the modeling realistic? Uh, like, how would we? Well, just... because it's not like uh, Cezanne. Let's go back. You know, that's a good question. You see here, the modeling is not even really. It's it's imp here. I would almost I said it softened a few. Yeah. But I didn't mean. Okay, I think I understand your question now that I think about the way you ask it. And it's a very good question. It isn't sharp and strong modeling, mm -hmm. but it is related to what the shadows on these objects. Try to look at these trees, for instance. You see what I mean? Yeah. I, I now that we're looking back at the other one, that it does make more sense now. So well, okay. sure. No, I'm glad you asked that because it is important to clarify those kind of things. Yeah. Uh -huh. So he never tried to just break things down into non-realistic you know shades of color but to relate the light and dark tones to the actual scene yeah Whether okay the landscape or uh, still life or whatever or, or, okay. okay here we go this one is so important here we go uh this is of course van gogh starry night the village he did two starry nights i much prefer starry night the river uh which is in i think the met in new york but this one is in um france i think it is yes van gogh starry night you know with two r's of course the village 1889 he had already had his incident with uh his ear but it's also uh it is a myth that he cut his ear off no it did not even close he cut his ear low but that can still lead to being uh dying from loss of blood if you don't get to a doctor which there's no way he can afford to go to a doctor. Although later on, he was under the care of a doctor the last few months of his life, the one that diagnosed him, but this is all before that. So when he uh, cut his earlobe, he nearly bled to death. He was living with Gauguin. It was due to an argument. It had nothing to do with a prostitute. That's another myth that he did it to give to a prostitute. Afterwards, he did send a letter with the yes the dried piece of his ear to a bordello that he had once visited but it was an afterthought and it was just a moment of you know illogic if you want to say minor insanity but it wasn't what happened and why he did that he did that self-injury in the heat of an argument or after the heat i should say it was right after the heat a heated argument with gogan and gogan was a nasty character he was vicious verbally and emotionally towards a man whose brother was paying their rent and food and pet buying their paint and canvases for them. He was living off of Van Gogh's brother when he treated Van Gogh like dirt and Van Gogh finally got angry enough to almost attack him and instead he turned the razor blade on his own earlobe. That's the facts of what happened. So this is right after that. It's an important point about the meaning of this painting. He committed himself with his brother's, you know, acquiescing or help to an asylum. Uh, an asylum back then meant a monastery where nuns prayed over you and kept you locked in except during certain outings during the daytime. So this is the view he could see from his, it really was a cell, you could just say room or cell, from the window of his room slash cell of the uh, village below. You know, the monastery was on the outskirts of the village and the mountains and the night sky. And we don't have to guess. His meaning, it's very direct. It's as close to a quote as I can come within like a word or two. It's almost a direct quote. So you could put quote marks around if you want. He told his brother that what he was trying to portray, you see the blue colors of the divine presence or slash God in the sky, that God's love is watching over us even as we sleep. It's a very poignant thought, especially since he had so little positive um, you know love except from his brother and one woman actually he did live with totally separate from the time he was with Gauguin years earlier I think a couple years earlier he did live with a woman who had a young child who was a former prostitute but she couldn't take the poverty <laughs> grinding poverty that he constantly lived with she finally left him but not because he treated her badly um, that's in that movie <laughs> it's a very powerful scene where they finally separate um uh, and that would be early on in his painting career. So it had nothing to do with the meaning of this painting, but the belief in a higher power is powerful in this painting. So he's saying, even after this near suicide, you would say it was an attempt at suicide, but it wasn't quite, not at that point, because if you're just cutting your earlobe off, you're not necessarily trying to kill yourself, but he could have died if Gauguin hadn't come back early in the morning and found him 
there and immediately called the police and uh, they came and bandaged him up. Then he took himself and committed, I'm sorry, committed himself to this asylum. And that's what we're looking at. So that's pretty much the whole meaning. I already covered the Van Gogh style. So we still need to get to Gauguin. I'm going to have to do it very quickly. This is dynamic, not a stable line in it. Of course, it's full of uh, overlapping. And here I'd say there's a little bit of a shortening on the roofs of the houses, but not much. It's really just overlapping and diminishing size. I would not call this atmospheric spec. It's not a blue hazy look here. It's, it's sharp and clear. Here you can see what I mean about the, the modeling we were talking about earlier. What little bit there is, it is related to the actual view he saw outside his window. Uh, and then in the sky, we have, you know, there's no similar texture. It's, it's just his imagination, of course. The, the stars and the moon he painted in this rather psychedelic is the word I did. <laughs> Fantastic, imaginary way. And of course, that's the only warm colors. Otherwise, the colors are mostly the blues of the cool, of course, but of the uh, presence, symbolic of the presence of the divine spirit. And then you have a little bit of the green here on the cypress trees. He really liked painting cypress trees because that undulating motion clearly, you know, is part of his state of mind <laughs> that he had to live with day in, day out. Largest object is the sky. There's no question that the sky has volume or mass. And then the mountains probably, and then there were close call between the cypress trees and the mountains. Okay, uh, and obviously has the rhythm of the swirling motion in the sky, the houses, the mountains. Um, is it balanced? It depends. If you count the sky as a single mass, then no, it's weighted toward the top. But the sky has volume here. There's no question. It's not empty space. Then it would be, I guess, right, uh, unbalanced uh, toward the top. And left to right, yes, of course. Well, to me, this is almost enough to balance it. The, the moon here with the mist, I guess, over the mountains is what that would be. But but those trees seem to have enough solid mass that you could say it's unbalanced toward the left. Okay, uh, our last artist of the day. I'm going to have to cut the very last one. Gauguin, G-A-U-G-U-I-N. Vision after the sermon, 1888. I'll keep this brief, but it's, it's really important. This is uh, the last new term, synthetism. Synthetism, I've heard it pronounced both ways. It's, I'm not gonna spell for you, it's on your handout, right? It's uh, near the middle of the page. Okay, it's a style of post-impressionist painting invented by Gauguin, comma, which portrays abstract concepts rather than literal reality, period. So it's a fairly short definition, which portrays abstract concepts rather than literal reality, comma. So what abstract concept is Gauguin trying to portray here? Mass hysteria, or you can say um, the power of suggestion. It's an incident he read about in the newspaper, he, he didn't witness it, of, of where women were walking home uh, French women, of course, in the countryside, these are peasants, walking home from church. And one of them, probably this woman here, said she saw an angel come down from heaven and wrestle one of their saints, probably what they studied in the Bible class that day or whatever in the sermon. So an angel from heaven, actually supposed to be a specific angel, but I don't want to get that detailed. We're running short on time. Just say one of the famous angels from the Bible comes down to wrestle with a saint. You can see he's got his hands around his neck uh, or his arms around his neck. And then, I love this touch, a cow walks into the scene. Obviously, if it's not obvious, we've got to write this. Gauguin is mocking these women. He had nothing but disdain for any kind of belief system, any kind of belief system. He wasn't a Marxist. He once was a stockbroker, if you can believe that, but he, he abandoned that because he, he got burned out on the whole concept of, you know, profit and greed and all that. So he abandoned, you could say, capitalism or at least a life led by that, uh, of course, which is what he had done before he became painter. And he definitely didn't embrace Marxism or any other radical philosophy. He didn't believe in a higher power. He thought all religions were stupid and, and uh, you know, self-deluding. So that's what, in essence, he's saying. His, his concept here is these women are deluding themselves and they were convincing themselves. They saw something when really they were looking at is an empty farm field with a cow walking through behind a tree. So he's trying to tell us 
we can see beyond what they think they see. And the reality is it was just a hallucination. So mass hallucination or mass hysteria, if you want to call it that, is the concept he is mocking and portraying here. So it's a good example, one of his first syntheticism paintings. He came up with that name, he dubbed that term. He's more famous for his scenes of uh, Tahiti, but we're probably running short. So I will show you the last one, but you won't have to take notes. It's a Gauguin Tahiti painting, but this one you definitely need to have notes on. So I've covered the meaning basically. He did have his, he briefly lived with, you could mention if you want, with uh, for a couple months or so with, with uh, Van Gogh and drove him to, <laughs> you know, injure himself. They argued all the time and he was uh, an egotist to the extreme degree. He was not a decent person, but he was a genius. There's, there's no two ways about that. And that's, you know, one of the ironies of, any kind of right historical epic or period, <clears throat> we know about that, right? Any other figures from history all over the world, frankly. Okay, so we have uh, a man who's, by the time he painted this, he was already, made, unlike Van Gogh, as one last fact about the meaning, he was successful. During his lifetime, his paintings were being sold in, at uh, galleries all over uh, France, especially in Paris, in including his later Tahitian paintings. But this is when he was still living in France. And he invented the style while he lived in rural France. Okay, formal analysis, bold outline. Oh yeah, he kept the bold outline. There is no technique for space, none except overlapping. I don't even see foreshortening. You might say there's some on this woman's shoulders. Okay, very limited, minimal, you could say minimal. There's not on the tree, I mean, just coming across, you know, literally diagonally across the middle. This is totally dynamic, not a straight line in it. There is implied texture here. Again, no cement texture. The closest it comes to is the edge of the top part of the tree trunk. But really, there isn't any cement texture. But here there is soft and diffused modeling, right? And fairly realistic. Uh, there's the rhythm of their hat. By the way, they're not nuns. <laughs> These are peasants they're wearing their traditional headgear. And so that creates rhythm, as do the hands and faces of the women as they pray. The largest mass, well, you decide, is it the tree? Is it the any individual? Maybe this one who thinks she said first she saw this vision? Or is it a group of these women overlapping each other? If that's the case, that definitely would be the largest mass. And then maybe it's the ones off to the left and then the tree, or maybe the tree is second. And then the uh, group of uh, four praying nuns, we only see their hands on three of them, off to the left would be third largest. Colors, Brilliant, look at that. I, he was a master at inventing new colors. I mean, what is that? Is it orange, is it red, is it purple? It's a combination. But it's mostly a, 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 a hue or shade, unique shade he created of red. Again, we know this isn't a real scene. I mean, you ever seen a red farm field? Not in real life. <laughs> so of course he's implying it's a hallucination. So that's warm as are the golden wings of the angel and the tree chunk, it's, a, yeah, it's varying more into brown. So I'd say more warm, but almost everything else is either the neutral color of their black robes or the dark blue of their sleeves and uh, cool of course, and white of their hats. And then their skin tones, of course, are warm. Um, and is it balanced? Um, I would say yes. Yeah, the angel here and this group of, you know, women, they're pretty much balancing each other out and the trees right across the middle. Okay, I'm going to show you one more, but you want to take notes on it. You can cut it from the list. Whoops. And that's uh, the last Gogan. So you can cross it off. Gogan Day of the God, 1894. Uh, this is a Tahitian painting. So all I'll say is when he lived in Tahiti, he painted the native culture. He admired it on one level. On another, he could not understand why they were so happy. <laughs> he have, wrote letters. We don't have to guess. He wrote letters too back home to his, uh, his dealer and manager. He abandoned his wife and three children and never looked back. I think he sent them one check from one of the sales of his paintings, minimal over years when he was making a decent living. Uh, boy, we are really past the day. You just join us at the end here, and this is the one I told everyone just now you can cross off, but I'm just saying what it is, because we're, we're now past our deadline. Gogan, Day of the God, you can cross that off. But it's just an interesting example of his Tahitian work, and his concept is still, or his style is still this abstract concept, that, that these people believed in all kinds of spiritual presence around them, and they were happy. They believed in a higher power, a meaning to life, and, you know, they had rituals around, you know, family, you know, celebrations, things that he never 
chose, he could have, but he chose not to participate in anything with any kind of belief system. And it's kind of sad because he actually, he did try to commit suicide. Van Gogh, it's the jury's out. He might've been accidentally shot by two teenagers who, who uh, stole a gun from their father and went out to find him. I'd say the odds are more than that likely than that he shot himself because why would you commit suicide by shooting yourself in the stomach? <laughs> That's how he died. And he lingered for two days but he was probably trying to protect those teenage boys. That's what the new biographies of Van Gogh say. But we know that, uh, you don't have to write this, but just if you want to mention, you could, if the last slide, the previous one, the other uh, Gauguin is on the test, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> vision after the sermon. He did try to commit suicide while he lived in Tahiti. <laughs> he was that depressed and that, you know, empty. And it was natives who found him on the beach that uh, pumped his stomach and saved his life. Okay, that's plenty. We've, we've got to uh, rather later than usual. I meant to end it right at 4.30, which is technically when we're supposed to end. So I will stick around now for any questions you have that are related to uh, the papers. Remember, if you just joined us, I think one person did. If you don't want points off, they are due by uh, midnight tonight. But if it's, you want to wait for a few more days, make sure you don't wait a whole week. But six days or less after by the 14th, in other words, there'd only be five points off if you need the extra time. Okay, and you know to submit them as a PDF with the cover sheet, which I sent everybody. Uh, and of course, label them and send them to Mark W at AOL and label them R2. Um, <clears throat> sorry, why don't we just do that last thing in case anyone's, uh, let's stop the share. Here we go. I just held this up earlier, but some people just joined us. Whoops, <laughs> it would help if I had it right side. Them. Right, just like you did your first paper, make sure you write short paper number two, right? And obviously it's 1.2. Last thing first. Okay, any questions now from anybody about extra credit or, or your papers? What we just covered, of course, you can watch if you didn't see it all or didn't get all the notes because we were covering a lot of ground uh, by 8 p.m. on Friday. I was a little late in getting, I confess, the uh, lectures posted it was Saturday morning before I got to the ones from last week. No class on Wednesday, remember. No class, so you won't see me or any other teacher from the JC on Zoom or in person. <laughs> okay, any any questions, anybody, about anything relating to what we just covered uh, or your papers or extra credit? Anybody? Okay, well, we've, we've gone past our usual end time. So, of course, I will be checking my email and answering questions if you choose to send them in that way. Otherwise, I'll see you one week from from uh, today, right? The thank you. 17th. Well, thank you. Yeah, on the 15th of November. All right. Good luck with your papers. I look forward to reading them. Great. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a good week. Thank you.